Well, here we are again, celebrating God's extravagant generosity, remembering together how we, who were, called, who were created in the image of a generous God, are ourselves called to be generous as God is generous, generous with our time, with our talents, with our treasure, and particularly on this Stewardship Sunday, generous with our money. There's that word we don't like to hear in church. I once knew a man who complained that all his pastor ever did was get more money and more members, which I think is a pretty good goal for a pastor, although my friend didn't mean it to be a compliment. An authority of no less fame and renown than Mike Slaughter, who is the pastor of the Ginghamsburg United Methodist Church over north of Dayton and Troy, has said that fully 40% of Jesus' teachings, as recorded in the four Gospels, have something to do with how we, as his disciples, are to use our possessions, that is to say, with the matter of stewardship, with our time, our talent, our treasure. So if we have an issue with the church preaching about money and teaching at least one Sunday a year or one season of the year on this subject, well, I best guess we'd better take it up with the Lord himself. Still, Jesus' parable of the talents, which is before us this morning, on this 23rd Sunday after Pentecost, on this penultimate Sunday in the Christian year. I love that word, penultimate. It sounds so educated. It just means next to the last. On this Sunday, the parable of the talents isn't simply meant to serve as an illustration for a motivational sermon about stewardship. Rather, Jesus tells this parable in Matthew to answer a key question which had been raised in Matthew's community in light of the destruction of the temple and the ongoing oppression of those earliest followers of the way, that is, questions about the end of time, about how disciples and followers of Jesus are called to live in the in-between era between the master's first arrival and his second, his final coming, when God sets things straight and makes things right, when God brings about and brings to fulfillment promise of the reign and realm and rule of God here on earth, even as it has already been established and evidenced in heaven. For the story is told about a master. And the word is kurios. It's a Greek term that the New Testament authors like to use to refer to Jesus himself. It means master or lord. A master, Jesus says, before leaving on a long journey, divides the vast wealth of his entire estate among three of his most trustworthy and able slaves. Five talents. The word is a unit of money. It's an amount equivalent to 15 years' worth of wages. Five talents are given to the first slave, two to another, and one to a third. You've got a whole talent, after all. It's a total of something like $5 million of wealth transferred from one who had to those who were have-nots. The five-talent slave takes his share of the master's wealth, $3 million perhaps, and immediately, which is also one of the gospel writer's favorite terms, immediately he invests it, thus doubling the investment in apparently short order. The two-talent slave does the same thing, again, immediately, and achieves the same astounding result. We aren't told what their investment strategies were, information for which we might long, except for the fact that the story doesn't belong to us. It belongs to Jesus, so we don't get to rewrite it. We come, then, to that single-talent slave, the one who takes his share of the master's vast bequest. One scholar has called it an absurd amount of money, and buries it in the ground. I pause here to ask, what item or attitude is so valuable to you or to me that we would literally or figuratively bury it in the ground in order to keep from losing it? Would it be money or some precious treasure or possession? Would you bury a loving and lasting relationship to protect it? Would you bury your security, your reputation, your status, your place and standing in the community? Would you be so loath to lose it that you would bury your health, your physical, psychological, spiritual, or emotional well-being? What would you bury deep in the ground, keeping it hidden, out of reach, out of danger? <clears throat> Ask
after a long time, Jesus says. And our ears have to pick up here. For like I said last week, this parable, along with the one that precedes and the one that follows it, addresses a community which lives in in-between times, in the midst of a long delay between Jesus' comings. After a long time, the master returns. And the three slaves are called in, one by one, to account for their stewardship, which is an excellent word for this morning. The first slave lays ten talents at the master's feet. You gave me five, I made five more, thus earning the praise of the master, the Koryas, the Lord. The second does the same, bringing four talents back to the one who had first given out two. Well done, good and trustworthy slave. The master says to each of them, you've been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. But then the third slave comes and lays his share of the wealth before the master. One talent, which remember, is 15 years wages. Master, he says, speaking much more expansively and extensively than the other two, because he has so much more to explain, so much more to justify. Master, Kurios, I knew you were a harsh man, weeping where, reaping where you do not sow and gathering where you do not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and in my manuscript, I've underlined those words and bold-faced them because I want you to take note of them in your own imaginations, perhaps blowing them up in 14-point type in your minds. I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. Fear. Fear does some pretty odd and strange things. It paralyzes us. It causes us to stop dead in our tracks. It, it keeps us from moving forward. Fear of loss, fear of injury, fear of life and death. Uh, fear does strange things to communities, and it does strange things to churches. How are we going to keep going? I don't know how many churches' goals are to keep the doors open. Dick, how many church conference reports were, well, our goal this year is to worship every Sunday at 9.30 and have Sunday school at 10.45. Thankfully, they do that. But fear locks us down. And yet over and over again in Scripture, the words are, be not afraid. Well, we know all too well the end of the story. That last slave is berated by the master as wicked and lazy, and he returns to his former status of being penniless, unlike the other two, who it appears at least are promoted to executive vice president. The third is, in the end, cast into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You see, the slave, when given the opportunity to live abundantly, in response to the absurd abundance of the master's extravagant generosity, and you knew I'd get that line in there somewhere, didn't you? The third slave, unlike the others, chooses to revert to a life of scarcity, of stinginess, of self-sufficiency and self-centeredness, that which was the dominant worldview before the master's unexpected bestowal. And so, so we, who have been entrusted with much, you and I, with an abundance of blessedness, not the least of which is material wealth, we sit here in a beautiful sanctuary, well-fed and well-dressed, surrounded by the symbols and signs of our faith in a God who created us and all things and who immersed us in impressive beauty and amazing grace in overflowing blessings. Later on this afternoon, we'll celebrate all of that as we gather at 430 in Wesley Hall for the annual Feast of Thanks an outpouring this year of extravagant thankfulness in response to God's extravagant generosity. We've been given so much by this God whose nature is to give. That's an interesting thing about the scriptures. The stories there are of a God who, who didn't create all things and go away, not a God who sits up on Mount Olympus somewhere, occasionally throwing firebolts down and sometimes getting involved with... Uh, with folks, uh, folks in the earth, this God, this God came to us. This God exists and lives with us. This God gives unconditionally, gives life, gives love. 
We've been given so much by a God who gives. And so we who have been created in the image of God reveal our divine origin by giving in return, our time, our talent, our treasure, giving back that which has been given to us in order that we might give it away. Thus the words from Jane Marshall's great hymn, What Gift Can We Bring, are instructive and perhaps inspirational to us today. Marshall wrote this hymn to commemorate the 25th anniversary of a congregation, a United Methodist Church in the Dallas, Texas area. And here we are gathering in the 203rd year of Worcester United Methodist Church's existence with more to celebrate and more to account for. Her words, which we sang, are these. What gift can we bring? What present, what token, what words can convey it, the joy of this day? When grateful we come, remembering, rejoicing, what song can we offer in honor and praise? Give thanks for the past, for those who had vision, who planted and watered so dreams could come true. Give thanks for the now, for study, for service, for mission that bids us turn prayers into deed. Give thanks for tomorrow, full of surprises, for knowing whatever tomorrow may bring, the word is our promise always, forever. We rest in God's keeping and live in God's love. And Marshall's last stanza, one which answers the questions posed by the first, serves today as the final word from this preacher as we gather on this 23rd Sunday after Pentecost, on this penultimate Sunday in the church's year, as we gather on this stewardship Sunday to consider the matter of our thankfulness, our extravagant thankfulness in response to God's extravagant generosity, this gift we now bring, this present, this token, this word can convey it, the joy of this day, when grateful we come, remembering, rejoicing, this song we now offer in honor and praise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat>